Okay. Um, and yep, it should there you go. There it goes. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, or only just afternoon. And thank you so much for joining us for our Arizona biography series, The Stuff of Legends. Uh, I am Janie Adams. I am the History Engagement Coordinator for the Arizona Historical Society. I'm also an associate editor of the Journal of Arizona History. Um, a little bit about the Arizona Historical Society before we get started. Um, the Arizona Historical Society uh, is a nonprofit educational and cultural institution and a state agency established in 1864. AHS collects, preserves, and tells the stories of Arizona's past through museum exhibitions, libraries and archives, collections, outreach, educational programs, and publishing. The Arizona Historical Society preserves our past, shares our state stories, and connects people through the power of Arizona history. And stay connected with us here at the Historical Society. Uh, we have virtual programs like this all the time. Consider becoming a member of the Historical Society. Members get print copies of the Journal of Arizona History as a benefit of membership. Um, sign up for our email list. That's the best way to stay informed about our programmings or through our social media. And you can always uh, drop by one of our museums and explore. So some helpful reminders uh, for this recording. This is a Zoom webinar. So we can't see or hear you. Um, so you won't have access to a microphone. You won't have access to a camera. But you can use the Q&A feature and the chat feature for questions that come up during the course of the webinar. I encourage you to add those questions as they come up and we'll cover them at the end. Or you can hold your questions for the end, whichever you're more comfortable with. This program will be recorded and a recording link will be sent to all registrants. Uh, and if you, again, if you enjoy this program, consider becoming a member of the Arizona Historical Society to support um, additional programming like this. And I'm gonna introduce our presenter. So Shane Murphy has led Grand Canyon River trips for 20 years and has traveled widely navigating the Hans folklore to present the real man as fact instead of the fiction that surrounds his legacy today. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Shane. Okay, thank you, Janie. Thank you, Arizona Historical Society. And I guess you hope you've got the full screen there. Um, so I want to talk about John Hans, 1837 to 1919. He was a road builder, a trail builder, a hotel keeper, and a storyteller at Grand Canyon. And that's what he's known for. But it, in Grand Canyon, as his story has developed in Grand Canyon, he's become more folklore than the real person. And what I want to do is really discuss the real person and deal with the folklore a little bit later. His grandfather was a German mercenary that fought in the Revolutionary War and located after the war um, to this area in what was in Tennessee territory. This is how it comes down, <clears throat> sorry, how, how it comes down on the map today. Here is a much closer look. This is John's childhood uh, home right here um, near Pounds Ferry, near Danbridge, Tennessee. Danbridge is the second oldest community anywhere in Tennessee. And to get to Danbridge, the family had to go across the river using Cowan's Ferry to get there. And that's why it's said that John Hans is from Cowan's Ferry, which, okay, that's close enough. Down here at the bottom of the screen, you see Chestnut Hill. That's where the huge bean, uh, Bush's Beans factory is located. But more importantly, the bigger story here is that John Hans grew up near an area called the Diggins. The Diggins is where a lot of famous Tennessee tall tell tellers came from, and they still come from this area. And I think it's quite interesting that he was born so close to the Diggins. Some of the Diggins wore off on John, and that's, I think, part of the, the ultimate story. Here's his father on the left. This is, sorry, this is Greenberry Hans, two words, not one. 
Uh, on the upper right, that's a cantilever barn, a structure peculiar to the times in East Tennessee. And the lower photo is John Hans's uncle's place. Uh, John Hans's house is gone, but it was about a mile down the road from here. And I think it probably looked an awful lot like this, just two down, downstairs rooms in a, in a sleeping uh, place in the attic. About 1847, 1848, Greenberry pulled up stakes in Tennessee, moved to the western frontier around what's called Rolla, Missouri. It's spelled R-O-L-L-A, but it's pronounced Rolla. He became functionally uh, literate there. I don't know how much school he attended. I did try to track down his school records. They're not in existence anymore, and he rode racehorses for income. Now, the Civil War came on. John separated from the rest of his family, and he joined the Confederate. Well, he wanted to be a Confederate uh, um, cavalry person, but the unit he wanted to join never formed. And so he was reassigned and went into the 10th Missouri Infantry as a private, and he also came out as a private. Uh, he fought at the at the Battle of Prairie Grove, Arkansas, in December '62, and that was pretty much a draw. Nobody really won that one. Uh, and then he fought at Helena, Arkansas, on July 4th, 1863. He was captured along with 750 other folks. He was put on a steamer sent upstream to Alton Federal Military Prison, where he spent nine months. And by the way, <clears throat> Alton, the prison was down by the river. All he had to do, all these soldiers had to do is get off the boat and walk into the prison. What remains of the prison has been re, uh, removed and put up on the hill. And this is all that's left of Alton Federal Military Prison today. After, uh, after nine months, he was transferred to Fort Delaware Military Prison where he spent 13 months. I took the photo on the right at Fort Delaware. This barracks was built on the footprint of one of the original prisoner barracks, and that would hold about 250 men sleeping side by side in three tiers on both sides. Um, when the war ended, uh, John went home to Rolla, hooked up with his brother, who had been working with Lorenzo Hickok, for the Union, and Lorenzo and George Hans and were joined by John, and they, um, well, how to say, uh, John was, was just part of a vast um, uh, group of people who ushered wagons across the plain following Lorenzo Hickok. Lorenzo is really a hero of the American West, and it's, we really, somebody needs to write a book about Lorenzo Hickok. He was Wild Bill, bro Wild Bill's a brother, and here's Wild Bill on the upper left, and his good friend Buffalo Bill Cody. They knew each other from long ago, and George Hans on the right there. Uh, they were all tied in together during during the war uh, in the in, the, in un Union lines, accompanying. Lorenzo across the plains was Henry Morton Stanley of Dr. Livingston, I presume, fame. He reported on the first uh, transit of the plains that Lorenzo and the, and the uh, uh, Hans brothers made, and you can read about it in period newspapers. Uh, in 1867, Winfield Scott Hancock and Lieutenant uh, Colonel Custer uh, chased the uh, Comanche around the plains for a while. And uh, George Hans and John both read, both wrote dispatch for uh, Hancock and Custer. I have this uh, plate up here. Just if you're ever stuck in Kansas, there's lots to do in Kansas if you're bored. There's all these forts to go to. They have great museums. They're very interesting places. Fort Larned here is really a, a wonderful place. Leavenworth, of course, has a museum, and so does Raleigh. Um, Fort Hayes uh, is a state park, but it's very well done. 
good entertainment there if you need something to do. Back and forth across the plains for three years, delivering military supplies, uh, going both directions. By the fall of 1862, Lorenzo and company were at Fort Union, New Mexico. Another really spectacular state park or national park. If you've never heard of it, I urge you to go there. And and I mean that's what it looks like. It's sort of like an American Stonehenge out there in the middle of no place. It's a pretty cool place. Um, from there, they rode, uh, delivered some supplies to Fort Apache in Arizona, and the Hans brothers determined to quit their independent work for the army and go to Arizona and start a, a homestead or a farm and try to supply the army with what the army needed. But first they had a last job to do, and that was to us, that was uh, to bring the Navajos home to the Four Corners from the Bosque Redondo. And they did that. That was a long trip. Uh, Lorenzo Hickok oversaw that operation. George Hans was an assistant wagon master. John Hans, uh, according to George's notes, which we don't have many of during this time, John Hans drove a wagon during the Navajo return to the Fort Corners. So that's a little piece of Americana that nobody suspected. I think that's pretty interesting. After that, Hans, uh, John and George and a fellow by the name of Jerry Sullivan formed a wagon train to Prescott, Arizona. They took a month to travel mostly under the cover of darkness to, uh, uh, for fear of Indian attack. And they finally arrived in Prescott on December 4th, uh, 1868. Prescott at the time was, was a small even though it's the uh, territorial capital, it only had 450 souls. And on the right is a map of Arizona at the time. The orange outline, orangish reddish outline area, that's Yavapai County at the time. Now it's much smaller now, but that's what we're dealing with. And the uh, Hans brothers bought 640 acres uh, about 12 or 13, maybe even 14 miles north of Fort Whipple, uh, north of uh, Point of Rocks, if you know where that is. A drought came on. Uh, they had a little bit of trouble meeting, meeting their goals, and John got fed up, sold to George's brother, or George's partner, sorry, and moved six to, about 60 miles southeast to this place. Uh, Ash Creek below Osborne Creek. Now, the reason I identify it like this is because that's the way I identified it in, in my book. Um, and the reason I did that was because I didn't want any, a lot of strangers just straggling in to um, Orm Ranch and Orm School. But here's more small world stuff. John Hans homesteaded the area that came to be known as Orm Ranch and then Orm School. So that's interesting too. And his, then his brother bought it. Shortly before George bought it um, and John moved elsewhere, they, the two of them uh, were involved in the Yavapai and Apache removal from the Verde to San Carlos. They took this is the wagon train route, if you can see my cursor. This is the wagon train route they took to San Carlos, where the 1,473 or however many Native Americans, uh, the, the rest of the outfit, they walked through uh, deep snows and uh, uh, forded swollen rivers. They had a hellacious journey to San Carlos. A lot of people died. They had cattle along that uh, perished from hypothermia. That's, that was the situation during that march. But at any rate, um, the Hans brothers also participated in that. And I think it's quite remarkable that John and George Hans were in the Navajo removal or, or the Navajo return and the Yavapai and Apache removal. John Hans relocated to uh, camp near Camp Verde on the blue dot. The red square is the Camp Verde Sutler store. 
Here's the sutler's store peer, uh, photo taken at about the time. The sutler's store still exists. It's now part of this, it's the southern end of Wingfield Plaza. Still looks pretty much like that. And it's now a, a restaurant called Low Places. And I just love to go into Low Places, which is nearby where I live and have a meal and sit around and think about John Hans being in the store doing business. And the reason I can do that is because I knew an old gal by the name of Babs Monroe who has since passed on, but she had a lot of day books from the original store there from the time of that, from the period of, from when that photograph was taken. And here they are and she let me take them home and go through them and I started to do that, and the first book I opened up had John Hans's name in it and the items he bought that day. And that really got me going on this project. And uh, I ended up photographing all of these pages and donating them to the Arizona State Library in high resolution JPEGs. And you can go to the library and you can study them there. They're not available online. Uh, a couple of examples from what I found, just, just for talking points here. Here's John Hance, October 7th, 1875. This would be before he moved to Camp Verde. He buys a satchel for a dollar, a bottle of whiskey. This is very typical of John. He drank a lot of whiskey and a knife, okay? So all good so far. And then right below him, his brother is in the store with him and his brother buys drinks tobacco, bread tickets, and a can of oysters for a fellow by the name of High Jolly, the immigrant camel driver. And who ever knew High Jolly was in Camp Verde? Well, the day books certify that he was in Camp Verde for a couple of months. And every time he was in the store, John and George Hans were with him. So they were obviously working close together. On the upper right, Here's another entry from October 78th. Uh, John Hans is buying boots for Smith. They cost $11. Those are expensive boots, a pipe. And then he also buys a pair of boots for himself. And the reason I have this underline is because this is actually John Hans's handwriting. And that is a rare and endangered thing. You hardly ever, ever see John Hans's handwriting anywhere. So that's really unique there. And down below, this is just a rather typical, uh, how to say, store visit for John. But you notice he's, there's that bottle of whiskey again. He's going to get in trouble with that whiskey one, <laughs> one of these days. Uh, on April 3rd, 1878, after he has relocated to Camp Verde and has started his second homestead there south of the river, or um, south of town by the river, he's in the store, he's the third customer, and he buys some, he wants to buy some paper tea, and, and what that means is tea bags, empty tea bags. But this fellow walks in, Murray McInerney, and John changes his mind, and after a couple of John's neighbors go through the counter, the same paper tea bags are listed under a new account named Hans and McInerney. I don't have the partnership agreement, but for me, this, satisf this satisfies the partnership agreement. Um, and they were very successful for several years. John, because he was a federal, because he, because he was a Confederate, he, he couldn't legally work for the Union, they, they, the Union Army didn't want him around as a contractor, but Murray McInerney was a contractor who, was, uh, you, who worked with the Union. And so McInerney supplied the people and uh, the contracts. And he was the money guy, the go-to guy, while John Hance uh, owned the property and the, and, the, and the wagons and the stock. And there was a perfect re relationship there for a while until John Hans had a gambling debt of over $900 or about $22,000, $23,000 today. 
and he actually mortgaged his homestead to Murray McInerney, where they both lived and worked. And um, after this document was repurposed yet again a second time, 500 pages later on, Hans managed to meet the goal and pay off his debt. Now, all, all's good the, the, like that, but the problem is that Fort Verde is not any more a fully functioning military outfit because the uh, Yavapai and Apache removal has moved the, the, uh, com the military's combatants down south to San Carlos. So Murray McInerney found other things to do in Prescott, but John Hans drove a wagon. He didn't have anything to do. So one of the last things we know that John Hans bought, or either John or, or Murray bought, was a $3 or $75 map today of Arizona. And that map was purchased in Camp Verde, Arizona, where the blue dot is. These are, these are mining areas. The red, the red things are mining areas. And I think this is probably the map because it's quite an exquisite document, has its own little uh, pocketbook to fold into and all that. So this is 1882. Next thing you know, John Hans goes dark for two years. There's no reports in the newspaper. There's nothing um, in store ledgers. I mean, he's just gone. And the next thing he does is he appears at Grand Canyon at a place that he called Glendale Springs. And this is a, the view of Grand Canyon from Glendale Springs. This right here has come to be called Hans Canyon and it wound all the way down to the Colorado River. And this is where John Hans built his trail into Grand Canyon. And people came from all over uh, to see his trail. And while we're here, it, it was at the time the only trail into the canyon. And John Hans built the only road to the canyon and operated the only hotel at the canyon for about 10 years. So Grand Canyon belonged pretty much to him. This is where it sits on the map today, uh, halfway between Grand Canyon Village and Desert View. Uh, more specifically, it's halfway between Grandview Point and Moran Point. There is this little, uh, little teeny tiny cabin, and there is Hans Canyon leading down into the river. And here's, here's the rest of the story. This little place that these photographs show, this is Grand Canyon's only year-round visitor center, hotel, restaurant, interpretive headquarters, if you want to call it that, mule barn, administrative complex, you name it. This is the exact center of Grand Canyon tourism for almost a decade. And about, as far as I know, about 1,100 people visited Hans there during the time. Now, they came to see the trail, what we call now Old Hans Trail, between Coronado Butte and Sinking Ship. And the, the first three miles down to Cottonwood Camp, where Hans had another cabin, um, that was pretty much straight downhill. And then from there, it, you, you got into the canyon, pro, well, into Upper Granite Gorge. This is uh, artwork by Thomas Moran. It's a work at, from the top of Hans, Old Hans Trail. And here is Thomas Moran himself on the trail. And here's the little kit box he used to make this art, okay? Now you see that this is not really a trail. It's more, it's more of a route, but that aside, it's the only route into Grand Canyon at the time. And that's why people came. But then they, what they took home more than, more than uh, um, the Grand Canyon was John Hans's stories. And that's how his reputation grew. This is, uh, a cottonwood camp, which he stayed at in the winter. He had a vegetable garden down here and lived off the land. Uh, just throw a tarp over the roof and settle in when the weather got bad. 
down below the uh, Cottonwood Camp, that's where you enter into Upper Granite Gorge, and that's where the going gets slick and steep. Uh, this is the same group of people. This is uh, working their way down uh, what they call Moran's Falls right here. This is John Hance holding the rope for them to come down. And this, I don't know who this is. I don't think it's Hance, but at any rate, it, this is the head of Sock Dollar Rapid in Grand Canyon. It's, that's where the, the trail went. Did not go to an asbestos mine. Went to Sock Dollar Rapid. Once you got there, there was literally nothing else to do <clears throat> except turn around and go, go back. But here we have the first lithograph of Grand Canyon in 1892, which is getting a little late in the tourist business at Grand Canyon, but it shows it's all about John Hans. It's He's still really the only place to go, Hans Canyon. Flagstaff is where people got off the train to take a buckboard for two days to visit Hans. Looking across the main canyon from the rim of Hans Canyon and down below the panoramic view of Grand Canyon as seen from John Hans's ranch. See, it's, Grand Canyon was all about John Hans. You couldn't, as, as, as someone said in his guest book, you couldn't have one without the other. Okay, we've talked about Old Hans Trail, and this is it here. Okay, and here's Sock Dollar Rapid. It just ends right there. There's no way to cross the river. Uh, Bill Ashers was a prospector and a good friend of John Hans's. They were very close, and he needed winter forage for his animals. So Hans, Ashers, and a few other folks chiseled out what we now call New Hans Trail which uh, you could ride stock nearly all the way to the river and you can hike that trail today. Really difficult to hike Old Hands Trail. New Hands is, well, it's doable. Let's put it that way. Um, but in 1891, Bill Ashers discovered an asbestos load on the north side of the river. That has come to be called Hans Asbestos Mine. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So the trail was extended to the mine, and then it was extended all the way downstream to Clear Creek. New Hans Trail ended up being about 28 miles long. A little bit of visual archaeology for you. After Asher's discovered the asbestos load, John Hans was no longer interested in being a hosteler, so he leased his property to several different concerns. The first outfit Here's John Hansen's cabin. They built a sitting room, dining room, and kitchen to, to accommodate the tent people here. And by the way, the rim's right here. You couldn't see into the canyon from the, from the camp, but once you walked 100 yards up the hill, the canyon was fell, fell away right in front of you. Uh, in 1879, or 97 rather, the Arizona Cycling Club, made the trip in 12 hours from Flagstaff and they beat the stagecoach on that same day by an hour. So that's interesting. Here on the lower left, 1899, we have the addition of the roof and the porch. And uh, we had some Sibley stoves here. And again, the rooms right here, this is, I love this lantern slide. It's very, very beautiful to me. Now, this is not an outhouse. This is actually the well where people would go for water. Now, the short story on this photo here, the lower right, is that John Hans never, while he claimed to own the homestead, he never actually filed homestead papers on this property. And he squatted there for some 20 years. Okay. And during that time, he, he leased the property he was squatting on to people who wanted to operate his hotel there. And it was always called Hans's Hotel, no matter who, no matter who was operating it. And in 1907, Martin Buglin constructed this huge building here with the, uh, it was called the, the uh, V Bar V Ranch. Uh, but the rest of that story is that 
the train pulled into the South Rim in 1901 and nobody needed to go 12 or 13 miles to see Grand Canyon. They could just get on the train and go to Bright Angel Hotel or the El Tovar, which was built in 1905. So Buglin basically turned this property into a party house for his friends. And he, he, he was not a big par party person. He was a cow person and entertained genially. Uh, but that's, that's the story behind that picture. Now, everything's all well and good. Hans is, um, he's prospecting. He's down in the He's down in the canyon, and he's also drinking a lot in uh, when he shouldn't be drinking. And in early 19, well, mid-1914, there were a couple of Japanese busboys, whoops, sorry, a couple of Japanese busboys at the El Tovar, and they went down the canyon, and they mounted a flag right here on the top of what was then called the battleship, but it's now called the battleship Iowa. Hans was drunk. He didn't like that. He he barged into the El Tovar, threatened to shoot up the boys, and there was quite an up uproar. He had to make a deposition a couple of days later, um, and this is just one of the newspaper headlines that that came out. Um, the 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 big headline was Tempest in a Teapot. Uh, the came pretty soon after the original uh, uh, episode. Uh, this was a multi-day affair. It was an ugly affair. John Hans was going to sue everybody, this, that, and the other thing. Nothing came of it except John Hans basically fell off the map at Grand Canyon. He was persona non grata with the Fred Harvey Company, who he was, uh, after the train pulled in, he started to work for them. And, and he was out of business. So he finally had to make amends and apologize to Fred Harvey, but he never, ever, ever got over that. And on his 80th birthday, he wrote this letter that just ripped into everybody. And I don't know who told him to shoot shoot the mouth that feeds you because that, that didn't work. Um, and, and he was really relegated to the, to the backwater of Grand Canyon, unfortunately. That really didn't slow him down, though, uh, but the couple or three strokes that he had in 1918 did, in this photo, what was that uh, he got on a mule, rode down into the canyon because he wanted to die down the canyon, fell off the mule, landed on a bed of cacti, spent the night there, uh, in freezing conditions. One of these fellows, I don't know which one, went down, found him, brought him out, cleaned him up, took him to hospital in Flagstaff, where, where he died on uh, January 6th. And he died in the, the Arizona Historical Society building that's now on uh, high, Highway 180 north of town. Um, um, and they even know the room he died in there. But anyway, he died January 6th. Here's his headstone. Here's his footstone. And these two are eight and a half feet apart to honor the enormity of his lies. It is said. Okay. Now, let's. that's John Hans's life in a very quick nutshell. Let's talk about his legacy just for a little bit. Um, this is a book, Personal Impressions of the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. It is a transcription of this book, but the fellow who transcribed it didn't really do a good job. He didn't know who he was talking about most of the time. He just sort of arranged the entries as he saw fit. And it's unfortunate because that book identifies this man right here, J.W. Powell, as John Wesley, as J.W. Powers. So the fellow who did that didn't really understand who John Wesley Powell was. Washington, D.C., uh, September 26, 1891, escorted the International Geological Congress to Grand Canyon. And where did they go? The only place you could go at the time, John Hans's ranch. And I think it's just so interesting that John Hans and John Wesley Powell actually knew each other 
you know, the two touchstone personalities of Grand Canyon history, they were standing right next to each other one day in uh, 1891. Here's another visitor he had a year later. This is Bill Cody, his old friend from the Plains. Cody's routine had changed significantly in the meantime. This picture is a group of British investors that Cody's trying to enlist in a North Rim hunting enterprise, which never happened. But what they're doing here is they're uh, toasting this fellow who's made his first uh, uh, big game kill in North America. Now, there's a book about this, which you can find online, The Girl Rough Riders. John Hance is purposed as someone else, and someone else is purposed as John Hance. And it's, it's both good and bad, but it is an interesting read. <clears throat> Wore off his finger, pointing at Grand Canyon, another one of those bylines of John Hans. You know, everybody knows he wore off his finger. Well, did he really? Because here's a photo from this right here, 1903. Here's an enlargement of that. He seems to have all his fingers in place. You kind of wonder maybe a little bit about this one, but in 1910, or at least in a photo published in 1910, he still has all his fingers. I think he did lose a finger probably in a riding accident, um, but that's all I can really say about that. <clears throat> then there's Darby, the famous horse who jumped over Grand Canyon. Oh, wait, one time he didn't make it. He fell into the canyon and crashed and burned, but Hans stepped comfortably to uh, dismounted very comfortably just before the crash and walked away unscathed. There's a very real typical John Hand story. But did you know there actually was a real Darby? Dar Darby was a gelding with a scar on his left fore chin. Here's Darby. This is Darby right here. This is over here. We have Mr. Nash. This uh, this is verso of this image right here. Uh, so this is Mr. Nash, that's Darby. This is Miss S on Billy, Susan Selfridge. And we're gonna get to her in just a minute. But anyway, I think it's really interesting that there was a, uh, a real Darby. <clears throat> okay, finally, John Hans's asbestos mine. I've already alluded to the fact that Hans had nothing to do with this, but I'm going to flesh it out here. Uh, there's uh, the asbestos mine on the upper left out there in the middle of nowhere, 800 feet above the river. Red Canyon enters here on the left. Okay. Uh, they had, uh, you could take, you could hike, ride your mule down around the corner and there's actually a place I found on a river trip where they had a boat and they could cross the river and still water um, to get to the mine. Here's the fellow who found, staked and recorded the mine all by his lonesome. And that was Bill Ashurst and that's his wife, Sarah. Here's the paperwork for the mine that was recorded in February, 1891. Now, thing is, the mine was so, the, the asbestos load was valuable, but the mine was so far away that there was no economic way to get it out of the canyon. So Asher's tried to sell the mine several times, couldn't do it, and he was finally killed by falling rocks. Uh, in the meantime, he and his partner, Curtis McClure, had made an additional 11 locations on that side of the river, uh, all dealing with asbestos. And they decided to sell the, 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 the 12 locations. So the beneficiaries were the Asher's family, who remained the Asher's family, Asher's fa uh, partner, Curtis McClure, and also John Hans, because they knew John Hans had a gambling problem and he was out of money and he was having hard times and they just cut him into the deal. Here's some of the paperwork. There's a lot of paperwork with this, but here's one example. So Ashurst et al. Um, 
made an offer to Susan Selfridge, who we've already, already talked about. She decided not to take it up and, and uh, after a few months and uh, assigned her rights to George Hills of Boston, who sold to Hans Asbestos Mining Company for a total of $6,000. And the Hans Asbestos Mining Company was named because John Hans um, had a camp by uh, uh, Hans Rapid and that's how that got its name. But the rest of the story is that John Hans sold 12 mines he never owned for $2,000. And that is a true John Hans story. So in summary, Hans was an early Yavapai settler, a decade long Verde teamster. He was the first Anglican GRCA, that's park speak for Grand Canyon settler. He built the first road to the Grand Canyon, the first hotel at the Grand Canyon, the first trail to the river. And people came for the trail. They came to see Grand Canyon, but then his stories took over. And during his lifetime at Grand Canyon, visitation grew from John Hans, just John Hans, to 38,000 souls the year he died. And he was responsible for bringing quite a few of them to the, uh, to the river, or well, to the canyon. Uh, here's the book that's for sale. Uh, you can order it in bookstores. You can order it, of course, from the University of Utah Press. The one place you cannot buy this book is Grand Canyon. Now, why that is, I don't know, except to say I think they like the happy little stories that John Hans used to tell, and they don't want to tell the real story. And I think that is not in their favor in this case. I also have a, a Pinterest page with a lot of John Hans information and photos, and you're certainly welcome to go there. That is uh, about it. I thank you for your attention. And um, I'd be happy to answer questions now. Thank you so much, Shane. I, I really appreciate you exploring where the mythology comes from. You know, we, we have a lot of characters in Arizona history that are larger than life. And so kind of exploring right. the truth and the fiction and, and sometimes fact is stranger than fiction in a lot of in a lot of those places. So a couple of questions from the chat. Um, one is what is your background and how did you become so interested in Hans? That is really easy. <laughs> That's a question I can answer. Um, I, I led river trips for about 20 years in Grand Canyon and um, Hans Rapids at River Mile 77 and it's a big bad rapid and it's obviously named for John Hans. And I, everybody I talked to, I, hey, how did, who was John Hans? How did that happen? And ev everybody, I mean, everybody at Grand Canyon knows. And this is part of the problem, um, Janie, because everybody will tell you, well, John Hans went to Grand Canyon and he found an asbestos mine and he built a trail to it. And no, that none of that happened. You know, and, and so, I mean, as I dove in and I drove across America a couple of times to each of these locations I've talked about and all this and the other thing, um, I came to know Hans very well. And, and I just had to tell the real story. It really got under my skin, especially when I found those day books. That was a big deal for me. And yeah, the, I end of the story. Absolutely. In a lot of ways, history is is a big game of telephone, and it is amazing how quickly, like, uh, um, an inflated truth or a lie or a misunderstanding, it's incredible how quickly that becomes part of the historical narrative, and it takes generations of historians to pry that apart and go, well, actually, that's not quite what happened. <laughs> You know, even the people who were in Grand Canyon, like the fellow who transcribed John Hansen's guest book. I mean, that was that was in the latter 1890s. And he and, and he was already a sort of a mythical figure in Grand Canyon. 
and people accepted that and didn't go with, with what they what was otherwise known. Absolutely. Um, another question is a little bit more about Hans's personal life. Um, did he ever have children? Um, did he ever settle down or not? <laughs> Well, did he settle down? His home came to be Grand Canyon, whatever that meant. He <clears throat> he ended up living in a tent near what became the Bright Angel Trailhead. And uh, he, he sort of languished there and spent his last days there. Um, what was the first part of the question? Did he ever have any children? Oh, no. We, I only know of one romantic attachment, which I describe in the book, and that was with a mountain climbing lady. Okay. And that, and he would, he would have been, uh, oh, about 50 at that point. And, but, uh, she just kept going. Um, no, there, there no, no, no wife, no girlfriend, no children, uh, a bachelor. <laughs> Full time bachelor. So these two questions are are kind of related. So yeah. one, are there remnants of his cabin or other sites that we can visit? And two, are there organized excursion down uh, the Hans Trail? You don't want to go down Hans Trail. There's really no place to go. <laughs> it, it falls straight downhill. Uh, it's just a, a very steep wash, um, and you can follow it for a couple hundred yards, but after that, it just turns into a rocky uh, prominence that, that goes straight downhill. You can hike Old Hands Trail. You need a permit if you're going to do that overnight. Um, guided tours, you know, the odd thing here, along with this book not being available in Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon, um, how to say, you drive right past Glendale Springs. There's no sign. There's no notice. There's nothing there. You know, there's no clue that that's where Grand Canyon tourism was founded and where the whole thing grew out of. Um, Bugland, if you know where Bugland Picnic Area is uh, between uh, um, in that stretch of road there, uh, that's quite near uh, Hans, Hans's original cabin site, but but you, well, just, just let's just say if you're a Bugland picnic area, you can walk out the room and you get a good feel for um, what Hans's visitors saw. Guided tours, no. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, every time I talk about taking a formally taking a group out there, I get a big no from the park service. So yeah. I'm, I'm happy to tell people where to find it and, and where it is, you know, and I'll send you a map. Just write me a letter and I'll send you a map. <clears throat> Not a problem. Uh, another question that Kate just came in is, is Mr. Hans related to our former governor? Not that I know of. That would be that would be kind of interesting, and it, it's funny because uh, with your earlier story about High Jolly, sometimes um, these historical figures kind of run into each other in interesting yeah. ways, or or their lives bump into each other in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. uh, no, not sorry, not that I know of. I never even really thought about that. I suppose it could be though. Next question. Yes. So another one is, um, aside from Hans's involvement in the Navajo return to Arizona and the removal of Apache and Yavapai from Camp Verde, do you have any insights on his attitudes towards or interactions with Native American people in the region? He was, John Hans was an Indian fighter. John Hans was, uh, he, John Hans did not like Indians. You know, uh, he grew up in, in, in uh, uh, Indian country, and the, in the, 
The Indians were removed from his territory just before he was born, uh, but they still made trouble, as, as the whites would say, they still made trouble. Um, Hans is often noted as an Indian hater, you know, and so that's, that's not a good resume there. Uh, I think it's interesting that he was involved in the removal and the return. All you know, that's that's really small world Americana stuff right there, which I really like. I don't know that he enjoyed working those trips or anything like that, but no, he he wasn't. Uh, um, he was not fond of Indians, and uh, several accounts detail him as quote Indian hater, unquote. So that, that's the short story there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question is, um, did you say that Hans's gravesite is at a pine is at Pioneer Historical Society on Highway 180? So can you give us a refresher about where that gravesite is? No, I'm sorry. No, I, do, I didn't, I don't think I explained that. It's a Grand Canyon Pioneer Cemetery. Mm. I meant to mention that and walked right past it. Uh, when when you by the Shrine of the Ages, that's where the cemetery is. Uh, it's near Park headquarters. And um, you walk into, you walk through the gate there and John Hans's grave is right dead ahead. That's where it is. So the, the connection to the uh, Coconino County Hospital for the indigent is that he passed there. He, yes, that's where he died. And interestingly, he broke out, even though he had a stroke and was pretty ill and really couldn't get around, he still knew where Grand Canyon was relative to that hospital. And he broke out of the hospital a couple times and had to be fetched off the road leading to Grand Canyon and brought back to the <laughs> hospital. He really wanted to die in Grand Canyon, but yeah. it just didn't work like that. Yeah. Um, another question is, is the story of him naming a point at the Grand Canyons for the Hollenbeck sisters true? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but the Hollenbeck sisters were big fans of John Hans. They believed deeply in him. They trusted him. And he, and he, what do you name? I don't even remember right now, but yes, it is true. All right, it looks like we've got one more on deck and uh, that question is, is there a reason why the park service is, is do you think is silent about Hans and his, his contributions? I don't know the answer to that. I know that they don't wanna work on it. I know that I have talked to the park archaeologist and other people up there, and I, you know, let's put us, let's put a kiosk up. Let's trade Bublin picnic area, which really, I mean, it's a fine, but why isn't that Hans picnic area? You know, I mean, it's right in the neighborhood. It would be very educational to people who stop by there. Um, they just really don't want to seem to deal with this. And I don't know if they're just hanging on to the past and just love the happy little stories he used to tell and don't want to deal with a real guy. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I really don't know. Yeah, definitely. No, it seems like he lived a really interesting life and it seems like there's lots of misinformation about his life and, and the things that he did. What I say is I call it all fact and mostly fiction. Well, he, <laughs> you know, he built a trail. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's all like that. It's all innocently misdirected in the wrong direction. Yeah. I think. I mean, that's the way I read it. So that's about it from here, I guess. <laughs> well, Shane, thank you so much for your time with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your afternoon to share this story with us. Well, um, I appreciate you and uh, everyone turned in and uh, turned to to watch and, and uh, listen to me. And I appreciate the opportunity from the Historical Society. Thank you. <laughs> so this is recorded. So if you miss something or, or want to hear it again, uh, hopefully I will have it uploaded to the Arizona Historical Society YouTube channel. 
uh, hopefully by the end of next week. And if you're registered for the program, you'll get an email of when that program is available. But thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice afternoon. Uh, happy early Arizona Statehood Day. Um, <laughs> and you take care. <laughs> thank you. You too. Bye. Appreciate it. Bye.